is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Julie Varney, CDA, FAADLM, Fellowship of the American Academy of Dental Office Managers. She's Director of Dental Practice Coaching and Team Training for Dark Horse Tech, Inc., is a motivational in-office coach empowering while equipping dental teams with simple solutions today for powerful results tomorrow. Julie earned her CDA from Hudson Valley Community College and in 2016 was awarded Fellowship of the American Association of Dental Office Management, where she is an active member as a chapter president. President. In 2016, she was named Top 25 Women in Dentistry by Dental Products Report Magazine. Focusing on building confidence and organizing chaos in the dental practice, Julie's mission is to enhance each dental team member's career by embracing their passion and bringing out the leaders within them. Julie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations. Oh, thank you for having me. Congratulations oh, thank you. for being named Top 25 Women in Dentistry. Uh, I would have named you Top 1. Uh, but I guess uh, top 25 ain't bad either. Um, I, I want to start out with a hard-hitting question right between your eyes, punching the sure. nose. If I, if I go to dinner with 10 dentists and I ask each one of them, what yeah. stresses you out the most? What, what's the worst part about being a dentist? They always say the same thing. My damn team drives me crazy. I mean, I Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's like they they say that leading a dental assistant, a hygienist and a front office is like leading three cats uh, around the block. I mean, it's it's like herding cats. What what advice? What advice would you give to dentists listening to you today? Or maybe there's a hygienist listening. You say, I love my patients. I love my job. but My dentist is detached. He hides in his office. The receptionist fights with the assistant. I hate the office politics. I love my patients. I hate the politics. So it seems like staff is just what makes you almost want to quit being a dentist some days. What would you say to those guys? You know, I say that to each of them, they need to embrace their differences and they need to empower to educate them to be their own leaders. It should be a self-led dental practice where all he has to do is come and do dentistry. And people want to grow their careers, and he has to give them the tools to do that, which in turn is going to be him more um, productive and profitable if everybody's their own leader. So it's it's make them their own leader, hold them accountable, and give them the tools to continue to grow their career. How does he get from here to there? You know, by putting the proper tools in place with the, you know, hygienist being part of her association, giving her more continuing ed, the front office, you know, ADOM's a great resource to help learn and grow the front office. Um, just I, my, I'm a big believer in tools and systems and educating more. My boss gave me all the tools in the world to, to make me better at what I do and to help others grow. If my homies listening, go to julievarney.com. What are they, yeah. they going to find? To help them go from getting beat up by their uh, uh, staff and having it be the worst part of their um, existence to uh, being a good part. Well, the thing they're going to find is all about me, for one, and what I can do for their practice, providing that simple solution. Um, I offer in-office coaching. I believe uh, as a dental assistant that your hands-on learning is the best. Um, So I offer two- to four-day workshops for them. monthly coaching, but my whole thing is to, what do you want to fix tomorrow, today that you can be more profitable tomorrow? So uh, I, I, I love your website. I'm sitting here lost on it, uh, reading it. Uh, <laughs> no, really, it's a, it's a good website. So, so you do in-office consulting. Yes. Mm-hmm. How, how does that work? How, how does my homie get you to come to his office? And what is a great client for you? What problems do you like to fix? How much does it cost? Does it have a contract? Do you see a monthly? Uh, is it a, a year-long program, two-year program? Go into, it's Dentistry and Sensor. Get into all the brutal uh, facts yeah. about how you do that. So usually start with initial call or like I've had some doctors text me and talk back and forth to text, which is fine. Emailing. Um, I'm on some forums on Facebook that I found a couple clients. Um, and then we talk about what, what their real struggles are. Um, I don't I don't want to go in and fix everything and be a cookie cutter. If they want to fix the schedule, I'll help them fix the schedule. If they want to know how to get more patients in the door, I'll help them with that. If their front um, office doesn't have systems in place for repair or accounts receivable, I'll help them with that. My I'm really simple. My price is um, $1,500 for two days plus 
the cost of my travel. How much was that? Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred dollars for two days plus travel. Plus my travel, and then each additional day is five hundred dollars. And and what does the average uh, client have you do? Do they have you come in for two days? Is that the average, or do they just yeah, have you come in yeah, for? Yeah, that's the average. Yeah, that's the average. It's usually because one day I observe. The first day I'll observe them. And then the next day, I'll help them implement and change what needs to be fixed. And you're out there in the field a lot, coast to coast. Um, the person yeah. listening right now is all by themselves, so they know what their problems are. But they're probably wondering, what are you hearing out in the field? I mean, what, what problems are people calling you, and what, what are they hearing in the field? A lot of times, is it's they have empty chairs. You know, why are people canceling or no-showing their appointments? Um, why aren't my co-pays getting paid? Why are my account receivables going up? How can I fix them? Um, my clinical team is not as efficient as I'd like. What can I do better chair side to help them be more efficient, to be more productive? Um, so those are some of the, the, the things that I hear out there. So the you're, biggest thing, so you're um, hearing more business stuff, empty chairs, no shows, cancellations, account mm -hmm. receivables, not, uh, staff issues, um, uh, my, my staff's um, not getting on. So, so you're hearing mostly clinical issues, I mean business issues. Yeah, or I meet with the office manager and she says, I don't know how to get Sally Sue up front to be more productive and do what I need to ask for. And sometimes it's just having conversations with them to make that office manager a more effective leader with her team. You know, this is how you can handle it. This is how you can make that person account and uh, accountable for their actions and help them grow as a leader and be more um, individual and help the practice grow. It's funny how um, so many dentists got their fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry and wear loops, but they never think, well, maybe my assistant hygienist should wear loops too, and Absolutely. maybe my front office should get uh, their fellowship in the Academy of Dental Office Manager. It's like they make it all about themselves. Like, you wear loops and you have your FAGD. Why don't your assistant hygienist wear loops? And why don't you have the girls up front join the American Academy of Dental Office Managers and get their fellowship in there? That would really balance the teeter-tighter and make make the team more homogenous. Agree or disagree? Oh, I definitely agree. I The more you can give your team educational-wise, the better off they're going to be. I mean, some people are just you can't change, and that's the thing where you have to let them go. But there, a lot of times they become stagnant. Or compliance and it's just because they want to do something different they want to be something more but they don't have the tools or they don't know where to look so hiring an office coach to come in to, to help them will make them love their job again and in, and in the end it makes you more productive because people are happy so you said you're mostly here empty chairs no shows cancellations account receivables what were the other ones uh collect oh yeah collect uh chair side efficiency what assistance? Collections, uh, chair side efficiency. So, so let's go through mm -hmm. some of those. Um, what what if someone's uh, what, what when someone's complaining about empty chairs? Like like what is the average office you're seeing? I mean, do they have four ops? What what is empty chairs? What, what what does it look like in these offices that are calling you up with empty chairs? Usually, the the average, yeah, the average that I'm seeing is they have two full time hygienists, and they have three or four open holes a day. And is it their confirmation, the way they're confirming the appointments, or is it their, the way that they are scheduling the appointments, they're not giving them enough time, so patients feel rushed? Is it because they're in or out of network, or is there something that the hygienist did the last time that they're not coming back in? So there's a, a numbers of reasons what can be happening, but you just need to pinpoint the reason to fix it. You know, when, you, when you're talking about, you were talking about that... Um Empty chairs, like the, the average that you're seeing has two full-time hygienists. They have three openings a day. A lot of people are on dental town th are starting to get disillusioned with their hygiene department because so many of them are on PPOs and they're getting $55 for a cleaning and their hygienist gets paid $40 an hour. So then you, you throw in three openings a day for two hygienists. I mean, is, is the hygiene department just a loss leader so that hopefully you'll find dentistry to do out of there for a higher fee? Or do you think the hygiene department can be a profit center, even though so many people are taking PPOs? I definitely do think they can be a profit center. Um, it gives them time to educate the patient by having that one hour appointment. A lot of times the di doctor comes in and diagnoses and then they end up walking out and they turn to the hygienist and say, 
well, what's that all about? And they give time to educate. Your hygienist and your hygiene team can be very profitable. Um, it's by putting systems into place and giving them the tools to be more profitable. Um, I've worked with um, Inspired Hygiene is a great uh, tool for any office. I'm If I can't take care of the hygiene department, they can do it. With Rachel Wall. Have you, you've interviewed Rachel Wall. Yes. Yes. I, I love her tools. I mean, if if, uh, if there's a hygiene department that I go into that really needs help that's beyond my scope, I will refer them to Rachel because they can get it fixed. So, Well, what are some of her tools? And because you were also talking about uh, no-shows and cancellations. A lot of people say, what is the best way? Uh, some people say um, have them fill out a postcard so they get it with their own handwriting and, and they should get that two weeks to four. There's a lot of technology you can buy that does... Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what do you think is the best confirmation system? I love Revenue Well. It's uh, up and coming, and it, it integrates with EagleSoft very, very well. Um, and it's been great for offices that I've used it in, where patients get the text, the email, they have a patient portal, they can pay right online, they can view all their information. It works awesome. And a lot of the the older generation are even catching on with, oh, great, I can get an email, a text, and. And there's some that still will want that phone call. It's it's just, I think, you know, communication, the the new technology way, that's the way it's going for patients. And texting, the 90% of people will answer a text first before they answer an email or a phone call. How come when I, when I call my four boys, they don't answer the phone, then they text back, what up? <laughs> right? So you might as well just text them. Can so you? text. Is the way to go. <laughs> I know. I never have figured out that. How can you be texting me back, but you can't answer your phone? That is a. Uh, that is. So, you pick up the phone and you answer your father. <laughs> so you like uh, you like revenue well. Revenue well, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Revenue well, and is that is that a uh, is that a dental play revenue well, or are they in many different verticals? They are actually. Um, they integrate with Dentrix, EagleSoft, Open Dental, and Practice Work. No, but I mean, is Revenue Well is that company only focused on dentistry, or do they do chiropractors, I, vets, physicians? Or I believe they're only focused on dentistry right now. Really? Reve- yeah. Okay. Let me uh, um, look at Revenue Well. Revenue. RevenueWell.com. RevenueWell.com. Uh, grow your practice by engaging your existing yep. patients and, and attracting. Uh, very interesting. So, so you like those yeah. guys. So, so why do you like Revenue Well? How did you uh, find out? T- tell us more about Revenue Well. So, I found out about Revenue Well from my Patterson rep um, when we were looking for a new patient communication system in our office at, at the office I worked at for 24 years. Um, so, we were using EagleSoft. And it is the best I find for EagleSoft that integrates flawlessly. It syncs right with EagleSoft. It pulls all your demographics and your information, your patient information. It has a very user-friendly dashboard. So if you're not computer savvy, you will be able to um, use it very, very easily. And what what features does RevenueWell uh, Revenue well do? Well, I like, my favorite is the patient portal because they can get um, all their treatment plans sent to them. They can look at videos from Pacey uh, Patient Education. They can schedule an appointment. Um, the patient portal allows them to kind of be more involved in what goes on in their treatment. Wow, I just went to Revenue Well on Twitter and they tweeted out uh, um, best podcast, uh, seven best podcasts in dentistry. And there it is, Dentistry Uncensored Podcast. Dr. Howard Friends, the founder <laughs> and publisher. You, of Dent- you should have you should have Alex Nudell on your podcast. Alex Nudell? I'll tell him. He's actually coming here to Syracuse next weekend. He's riding his Harley from Buffalo to Syracuse with Anastasia Tachetta, um for my Tooth Fairy run. Alex Nudell, N-U-D-E-L? N-U-D-E-L. Mm-hmm. That is something, you know, that they didn't really have 30 years ago, these, uh, these, no. these deals. Does it make you wonder why, um, you know, like Revenue Well comes out and you say it integrates very easy with EagleSoft. Mm-hmm. I always wonder why EagleSoft and um, Dentrix didn't have all these features. I think Dentrix had something like, uh, was it Demand Force or Solution Reach or something like that out there? I'm not really familiar with Dentrix products, but EagleSoft at one time had um, another company, and I can't remember, I don't, I don't even remember the name of it, but it wasn't... Um, it wasn't as good as utilizes revenue well. It didn't really integrate. I mean, it's. 
I think they really made it for Eagle Soft. Now every, everybody else is picking it up though. So. So, so Alex Nudell says that he lives in uh, Florida. So he's coming to speak at what? You're you're the president of your New York chapter. Uh, I'm the Syracuse chapter president of Adam. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's he's going to come speak for your group. Well, actually, he's not coming to speak. He's riding his Harley to raise money for my non for profit. For your not for profit. Yes, I have a non for profit. And what what, what is that? Myfirstdentalvisit.org. Send me that, Ryan. MyFirstDentalVisit.org. Well, tell me about that. So my first dental visit is um, raising funds to give children access to dental care. In our surrounding counties, a lot of kids don't have access to dental care because there's no pediatric dentist. So we have an annual tooth fairy run, and Anastasia Chichetta and Alex Nudell are riding their Harleys from Buffalo, which is about two and a half hours away, to Syracuse Harley store, for our run that's on October 1st and raising money to do that. That is just amazing. And what, what's that website? Myfirstdentalvisit.org. Yep. Wow. So tell us your journey. When, when did you start that? And, and tell us more about that. Oh, sure. So last year, a group of us, uh, myself and a company called Orabrite, Oraline, they're a dental marketing company for toothbrush products. Um, our team got together and wanted to start a tooth fairy run. So we started a, a tooth fairy run to kind of bring the dental community together. And we wanted to keep the funds in the community. So Lisa Rogers and I and Lisa Spradley, which you've interviewed Lisa Spradley before, the front desk lady, um, got together and started a non-for-profit so we could keep the dollars in the community. Because a lot of non-for-profits, when you raise money for them, you hand it over and it doesn't stay in the community. Right. So our goal is to keep dollars in the community support local businesses, bring the dental community together. And my goal eventually is to have the race come across to different cities and keep those funds in the, in the, in the community for dentists to do days of dentistry. I just um, uh, retweeted uh, or at or bright underscore yep. at or bright okay. underscore. Yeah, and uh -huh. just um, uh, retweeted your myfirstdentalvisit.org on Twitter is at myfirstdntlvisit. Uh, just retweeted that. Orbright is getting ready for the Tooth Fairy Run. Sign up today. Yeah. And, uh, and then another one is uh, win a 2018 trip to Disney. Visit toothfairyrun.com for more information. Is that you also, Tooth Fairy Run? Yes. The toothfairyrun.com. So you can go to toothfairyrun.com and register. Yes. My God, you are you got to be the busiest person I know. Uh, that, That's that, what Ruben says. He's like, you're so busy. He didn't even know that I had the Tooth Fairy Run. He's like, oh, there's a Tooth Fairy Run? I'm like, yeah, that's kind of mine and some other people's, you know, race. <laughs> that is <laughs> so area. cool. That is yeah, so you know, thank you. I like to bring the dental community together. We always get together at conferences and and learn and learn and learn, but I don't think there's really a lot of events that you just to get together to socialize, hang out, and have a good time. And Lisa Spradley is involved with this too? Yeah, she's on the board of my first dental visit. She's in involved in it, the front desk lady. Mm -hmm. And she just uh, she just donated one of her kidneys. She did. She just donated one of her kidneys to a lifelong friend um, who's also a dental assistant and worked with her for many years. Mm -hmm. Is that lady, that girl was a dental assistant that worked for her? Yeah, worked with her, worked for her, yeah. I mean, that has got to be the biggest gift anyone can ever give. I mean, she I mean, that's... Has an amazing heart, an amazing spirit. I mean, what, what is her tagline? Uh, the front office lady? Front desk lady. The front desk lady. I think they should yeah, rename her uh, the front desk saint. <laughs> I, I, mean, said that. I mean, that's, that's, that's approaching Saint. I mean, that, that's Mother Teresa, Calcutta level stuff when you're a front desk she lady is. and you donate your kidney to the dental assistant. Yes. Yes. I know. It's amazing. I mean, who, and who in dentistry and did, who, name one person who did one thing that beat that in dentistry. I can't, I can't even tell you, Howard. I don't know. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is just, I mean, that is at a, another level of love. Oh, it is. She's an amazing person and she wears her heart on her sleeve. Yeah. My gosh. That is just, that is just unbelievable. 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 Um, so, um, so 
so you, you talked about uh, no shows and cancellation. You said you like to yeah. use revenue well. Uh, let's let's move to the ugliest part of dentistry, um, sure. having to ask for money. They don't like to sell dentistry. They say, I didn't go to dental school seven years to be a used car salesman, right. mm-hmm. and I sure as hell don't want to ask for money. Talk about uh, account receivables and collections. I think you first start with, with a, a financial agreement in your office. Because if the patient knows what's expected of them, just like when you go to your local grocery store, get your hair done, you know exactly what you have to do when you walk in there. At the end, you have to pay. So if you have a financial policy when you come into the office that the patient is aware of and what their expectations are, there shouldn't be an issue asking for money. And you really do need a strong person up front to ask for money. If someone doesn't like to ask for money, they can't be the front desk person. So... I don't have an issue asking for money because I feel they've already known the expectation. I've explained their treatment and you put it to them in such a manner that they're like, Oh, okay. That's all I have to pay. Yes. This is all you have to pay today. Um, you know, cash check, credit card, care credit, however you want to pay for it. Um, so it's, I really think it's starting with having the patient to know what the expectations of them are for collecting and and what their co-pays are. And that's all they want to know. They just want to know what they ha- they're responsible for. You walk into McDonald's and order a hamburger. A 16-year-old mm-hmm. kid says, give me three bucks, and then they give you the hamburger. Then you go into mm-hmm. dentistry, and you say, I want a $1,000 crown. And they go do the $1,000 crown. Then when they're walking out the front, they're saying, oh, by the way, uh, you owe me um, half of that right now. Um, and then the next thing you know, they're over 30, over 60, over 90. It seems to mm-hmm. me it's a nightmare for the young dentist that just opened. It seems like they have to learn that lesson the hard way. How do you, how do you get to be more like McDonald's where pay your portion first and then we sure. give you the hamburger instead of giving you the hamburger and then begging for money? Right. It's preparing your patient. So I think it starts initially when you make the first appointment with them. These are our expectations. And then when you when the doctor diagnoses that treatment and they come up and say, how much does that cost? This is the expectation that you're responsible to pay for and them knowing it. So you tell them when they make the appointment, they leave. You tell them when you get their pre-auth, if you still do that, the pre auth back. You call them a couple days before their appointment. You let them know, just by the way, let you know your copay is X, Y, and Z. How did you want to take care of it? Do you need help taking care of it? Do you need some tools? So by not sticker shocking them, shall I say, when they come in and preparing them and and communication is the big key about that. So you have to prepare them for that. And they'll tell you whether they can afford it or not. But a lot of times they just want to know the cost so they can prepare. They know they need it done. They just want to know how to prepare for that. I'll talk to Dennis and sometimes I'll say to him, I'll say, do you think you're a good dentist? They'll say, oh, hell yeah. I mean, I've gone to Spear (laughs) and Panky and Coise and all this stuff like that. And they Uh have all this alphabet soup behind their name. But then you're looking at their office and they have the national average treatment plan acceptance is 38%. So if he diagnoses 100 cavities, we're not talking about veneers and bleaching and bone, we're talking about decay. He drills, Mm -hmm. fills, and bills 38%. And he thinks he's a good dentist. Then across the hall is someone who didn't go to Koi, Spear, Panky, um, or um, Ross Nash, or any of these institutes. But he has a two out of three treatment plan acceptance rate. And I can tell you after 30 years that one out of three patients aren't going to do anything you say, whether it's quit smoking, lose weight. I mean, I I have patients that show up to the office in wheelchairs with oxygen tubes in their nose smoking. (laughs) So not, not, not everyone's going to do ideal treatment, but, but how, but then I say the dentist, when talking about treatment plan, he doesn't like cells. He doesn't want to sell. And I'm like, well, how can you be a good dentist? If only one out of three people with a cavity get their decay removed, And I think the guy across the hall is a better dentist because he removes the decay two out of three times. And you say he's no good because he uses amalgam and you use composite. I mean, I mean, how do you approach selling dentistry? I mean, it's still a four letter word in dentistry. It is. And it is. And I really think it stems with the, the patient relationship and the connection you make with them and answering all their questions, giving them the facts up front having the hygienist and the assistants be educated, the whole team. I mean, there's nothing worse. And I was an assistant that you turn to the assistant and they're going to ask you, what did, what did doctor just say? 
And if you don't, if you can't answer, then his message and his value has been lost. And it makes him look bad if he doesn't have his whole team on board with what his beliefs are or his visions are or his diagnostic qualities are. So, and then it has to be carried out front. So if the assistant brings them up to the front and says, Sally Sue needs this crown, and then she leaves and we get them scheduled and the, fr the lady asks the front desk and she's like, well, I really don't know what a crown is. Well, then the message is lost again. So it really makes them question, well, gosh, if nobody knows what a crown is, why am I here? Because I don't even know what it is. Why should I get it done? So I really think having the same message and the patient handoff, I'm a big believer in a good patient handoff, really carries the message through. You know, my astute listeners know um, what I'm about to say. And if you just joined the program a thousand shows later, I think it's so interesting that when I talk to dental office consultants in the real world, working coast to coast, you know, when I said to her, I said, well, what, are, what, what is the uh, average problem you're, you're seeing? You said empty chairs, no shows, counter receivables, collections. Yeah. And I say, well, on empty chairs, describe an, an average office. And the first thing you said was two hygienists three openings a day. Do you realize what I'm going to say is the fact that the average dental office does 750 and doesn't even have a full-time hygienist and they net 174. You go to consultants and, they, and they've been doing this for a long time. I'll say, what does the average dental office do? And they go, oh, I don't know, million, two million. So her average client has two full-time hygienists. And that's what I keep telling you guys because you want to make an investment and in, you, you want to be better. So you want right. to buy something. So you get chair side milling, oil scanners, CBCT, all this stuff right. like that. Mm -hmm. But it's the consultants that bring the highest return on investment and get your house in order. Everybody I know that's my age, 55 to 65, doing two right. to four million a year, has used a dozen different consultants in the right. last 10 years to get there. And I know you want to learn dentistry, but you just have to, why don't you, you're, you're stressed off at your office. Fix that. Your staff doesn't get along. Fix that. You have empty chairs, no shows, cancellations. Fix that. Your account receivables, collections getting out of line. Fix that. But what do you want to do? You want to go learn bone grafting in the Dominican right. Republic. And then when you get back from this very amazing, fun bone grafting course in the Dominican Republic, you you're, have like, to implement it. you're like, oh, I got to go back to my office and deal with my crazy staff and my over Ed's high and blah blah. Get your house in order. Get so you can get poised for growth. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you another philosophical question because yeah. I I know my dentist. I've been one thirty years. I've been on Dental Town four hours a day since nineteen ninety eight, seven <laughs> days a week, including Christmas, Easter, and Hanukkah. Um, some of the dentists, though, they'll, they'll just tell you they don't believe in office managers. And they don't believe in treatment plan presenters. They think the dentist should present the treatment and they think the dentist should be the office manager. What do you say to that guy? I mean, does that work? But does it work better with an office manager and does it work better with someone else presenting the treatment mm -hmm. or is doc usually the best office manager and the best treatment plan presenter? I don't think he should wear that many hats. I think he went to school to do dentistry, and I think he should find not so much a manage, because sometimes using the word manage means people think they're going to be like little puppets on strings. So I think having a leader, one that can carry your vision and run the ball, um, you know, and, and, and just see your vision. I mean, before, it's, it's, it's an, I don't know. I don't think they should be, I think they should co-help present the treatment. But I also think your team sells more, can sell more dentistry than yourself. Well, his, really his, do. his team can't sell any dentistry because he tells the hygienist, the assistant, that they can't diagnose x-rays. They can't diagnose in the mouth. Right. He tells right, them all this absolutely. stuff. And, and I'm like, I'm like my assistant as she's as a new patient and she's taking each x-ray as she throws on the screen. She says, see that right there? That's the filling. And see right there, yep. that's the cavity. And then the next wave. See that cavity? That see how it goes the nerve? You came in saying it hurt on this side. See the cavity in the nerve? So that tooth, right. you either have to pull the tooth or do a root canal on the ground. I have no problem with all my staff saying that. And mm -hmm. so many dentists say, Well, she can't say that. And I'm like, okay, well, well how many dental assistants are in jail today for saying that? I'm pretty right. sure you're right. in jail. 
uh, for selling uh, uh, drugs and stealing cars, not reading <laughs> bite wing x-rays. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's a huge yeah. problem. And, and as an assistant before, I mean, I worked with the same dentist for over 18 years and the one before that, and they trained me to read the x-rays, how they wanted to diagnose their treatment and what was right. And I could, you know, like you said, take an x-ray and I could tell the patient, you know what, that tooth doesn't look very good. Let me get Dr. So-and-so and I'm going to have him tell you what needs to be done. But it looks like you might have to have a root canal on that tooth or it might look, you know. And is he serving time in prison today? No, no, he's not. No, he's he not. He taught you how Once to read x-ray. There's dentists out there listening that think he should go yeah. to jail. Yeah, well, probably, but no, he's, you know, one's retired and living in Marco Island, and the other one is uh, still practicing. He's down to three and a half days a week, and he's doing well. So, yeah. he, had a very, he has a very successful practice, you know. I'll go, I'll go into a dental office, and um, they have a 38% treatment plan acceptance rate, and then when doctor goes into a hygiene check, hygiene's been there for an hour, and she says, um, you might uh, you might want to check, there's a little something on the upper right. I'm like, a little something on the upper right? You went to four years of college? What the hell's a little something on the upper right? My hygienist would have taken a PA and a bite wing, diagnosed yeah. with that, it's, it carries in the nerve, told the lady we can either extract that and it'd be nicer if after they extracted, they put in a bone graft. It'd be nicest just to do the root canal build up and crown. Uh, if you can't afford the root canal build up and crown, you can't do the root canal and then walk around the temporary for a year because not having a final right. restoration is the number one cause of root canals failing. And, yeah. and if you did extract it, later we'd go back and place an implant in a crown. I mean, they, they'd sell the, they'd explain the whole damn thing so, but that right. doc is his worst enemy because the demon living between his ears says that she can't do any of that. Right. And we always had a motto in our office and my team that when doctor would walk in the office, they would say, hey, doctor, you know, tooth number 31 doesn't look so good. It's a really a big area of concern. I want you to take a look at it. And I came to you in, in the office and talked to you about it in your office and discussed it before. You know, so we kind of prepare them. We always prepare them. And we've already had told the patient that that tooth didn't look good. So they were kind of waiting for doc the doctor to tell them why it didn't look good or what they needed done. And then after the doctor would diagnose and walk away, we would tell them, okay, did you, did you understand what they said? This is why you need it done, so on and so forth. So we kind of prepare. We always like to prepare the doctor. But most of the time, you know, yes, we can't technically license and diagnose. But most of the time, the, the person's been in the chair for the hour, they have your trust. They have that hygienist trust. They have that assistance trust. And then the doctor swoops in and tells them, they're kind of like, what? But if you've prepared them, I we were all big believer in preparer. And, 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 the, and the case acceptance rate was great because the patients trusted everybody's recommendation. You know, what would you do if it, you know, you needed it done? So... When you see um, your average office has two hygienists, three openings a day, um, do you do you see you, you talked about you believed in a great handoff? Do you yes. is the handoff to someone whose title is treatment plan presenter, or is just the dental assistant and the receptionist all are great handoffs, or is it usually one person? You hand off, like when, I, when you come in my house, I say, Julie, that tooth's broke. It's, there's not enough tooth for a filling. We need to do a crown. And I right. hand you off. Who do I hand you off to? An assistant, front office, treatment plan coordinator? Is it one person? Does everybody cross train for that? Talk about the, the, what you meant by we, a great handoff. So we taught, we, always, we taught each other to be everybody's cross trained. So everybody does the same handoff. So if you walked in the room and the patient's in the chair and they're diagnosed, whether you're in the room with the hygienist or the assistant, that hygienist is going to say, Joe, did you understand what the doctor say? And, and if he didn't, then he'll, she'll explain, okay, let me get you up front to Christina. She is going to make that appointment for you for X, Y, and Z. And then when he, she escorts, I'm a big believer. You just don't let the patient be unattended anytime in your office. You walk them up and you say, hey, Christina, this is what doctor recommended today. This is what needs to be done. Joe's going to get scheduled for that. Joe, do you have any questions? And then ask Christina. And then Christina should say to Joe, Joe, let me get you scheduled what doctor had said and what needs to be done. What best works for you? What day better works for you, morning or afternoon? Do you have any financial concerns or issues? Let me go over that with you. So it's, it's repeating the message all the way through, not just, 
hey, he needs to schedule an appointment with doctor, and then they turn around and walk away. You're also associated with darkhorsetech.com. Talk, yes, what, I am. What, what is that what is, association, and what is darkhorsetech.com? So Dark Horse Tech is your IT guy for your office. Well, I know that. <laughs> um, so Dark Horse is a dental IT company. And back in March, um, Rugen has um, done a really great job with amazing offices around where I live. And he supported my chapter of ADOM. And he has offices across the country. And I recommended a new office to him. And he's like, you know, this is like the 10th office you recommended. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to come work for you. He's like, great, you're hired. What do you want to do? And I said, what? And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I just want to make an office better with simple solutions. I don't want to go in there and promise them that they'll make millions of dollars. I just want to fix what's broken and, and have them be better tomorrow, today. So, so I was hired and I started working for them as their practice management coach. And I coach out some of a lot of their clients and more that are not their clients that hopefully we convert them to horse tech. Uh, clients and we, so. we, we had him on the show uh, earlier and he's my guy um, so what yeah what what are yours what do you and him do what what are solutions that what what problems are you fixing because I'm trying to you know she's driving to work right now she only knows her office she only knows what she knows she doesn't know what she doesn't know what pro- when you go and observe for a day you say you mm-hmm. like uh, $1,500 plus travel two days first day observe second day fix broken things um, what, yeah. what do you what do you think is broken in her office? And she knows what she knows, but she doesn't know what she doesn't know. What do, what do you think she doesn't realize is broken that you guys fix? A lot of times, you know, it's a fresh set of eyes, but a lot of times it's the the communication with the patient, the how they answer the phone, how they schedule the patient. They just they see the white space on the schedule, so they just plop them anywhere. They don't listen to the patient of what's going on with them. Um, they uh, just say, "Oh, well, to get that copay later." Well, no, we won't get that copay later. So there's a lot of things that I observe for to, to see, like, let's try this. Let's say, hi, how your copay is X, Y, and Z. Or have the hygienist say, let me get you a proceeded a schedule for your next six months and take your copay. So that patient's already thinking they need their copay. So a lot of times I just see little things that can be tweaked that's going to make a big difference in the long run. I practice in Phoenix, but everybody, yeah. when I opened up my office 30 years ago, it was called Awatuki. And then it got annexed by Phoenix, but I've never heard anyone in Ahwatukee say, I live in Phoenix, even though it's Phoenix, Arizona. And in Ahwatukee, right. we have an Ahwatukee business chamber, and there's, I think, like 400 businesses in Ahwatukee, and the area is about 80,000 people. But what I find the most amazing about all these businesses in Ahwatukee is the highest paid person in the business is the person doing outbound sales call or receiving inbound sales leads from the internet or uh, whatever and trying to answer that phone call, get the sell, make the money, that person's making six figures. And then the guy in the back in the machine shop making whatever, that's, that's the lowest paid person. And then you mm-hmm. go to the dentistry and that guy back there in the machine shop making the fillings in the crown, she makes six figures. And the person answering the phone is named after a piece of furniture, the front desk lady, and she has no <laughs> training. And they don't tr- they don't record her phone calls. They don't they don't give her any training. Right. She's the mm-hmm. most significant person in the office. And 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 I, I look at I look at the average dental office. You know, in America, it does seven fifty dentist nets one seventy four showing the IRS. Yeah, and absolutely. Twenty people have to land on their website before their crappy website converts one person to call. Three people have to call before your untrained receptionist can convert one to come in. And three right. people have to come in with a cavity before you get one to drill, fill, and bill. So to do that one filling, you needed three patients, which means nine people had to call, which means nine times 20. God, I don't even want to know what number that is. Nine times 20 <laughs> is 180 people had to land on your website and people are saying, what do you recommend for uh, search engine optimization? Dude, peep the, you know, the number one search in dentistry is dentist near me. So these consultants who say, well, I'll make you show up number one on Google search. No, if, if I am searching dentist near me in Phoenix, no one in Syracuse is going to show up. Um, there, no. Google is going to throw you to the closest dentist in your zip code. The problem is 
180 people have to land on your horrible website before you drill, fill, and bill. So why don't you fix the one out of 20 conversion to call? Why do three people have to call the front desk before she can convert one to come in? And why do three people have to come in with a cavity to have one person get it filled? Talk about how you can fix any part of that funnel. I think, you know, we are the first impression and the last impression. So we're the first people to answer the phone and take your call. And if you get Sally Sourpuss on the phone, you know, hi, this is Dental Today. How can I help you? Well, well that's you not very Sally easy. Sourpuss? Yeah, <laughs> Sally I, Sourpuss. I love that. Sally Sourpuss. <laughs> that is funny. We want positive patties on the phone. You know, upbeat, positive patties. Love that it. Answer the phone with a smile. Make you feel. Ask your name. I mean, this is all stuff that anybody can learn in five minutes how to change your conversation when you answer the phone how can we help you you know why did you call us oh someone recommended you oh great well thank you so much for that you know what did you struggle with with your last dental visit what didn't you like about your last dental visit you know i mean it's all in, i really think it's all about a relationship i mean i've turned the worst patients and the best patients i mean i kicked the guy out of a practice because he didn't want to get x-rays and he brought me the letter and he said, all I have to do is take x-rays to, to stay in your practice. Yeah, that's all we want to do. Doctor is not Superman. He can't see between your teeth. We just need some x-rays. He's like, well, I didn't know how important that was. So it was making that connection with him and, and, and finding what motivates him to do the dentistry that you want him to do. And the dentist, you know, it's, it's all dentist centric. Like you ask a dentist, are you, is your office patient centric or dental centric? Oh, it's totally dental centric. Okay. So your hours are Monday through Friday, eight to five mm -hmm. and one out of three Americans can't even do that hours. You have no early morning, no evening, no weekend, but here's where it's really dental, dental centric. The biggest measurement, the dentist, mm -hmm. since he owns the office and is lazy, he has two assistants, but he only has one receptionist and one hygienist and the receptionist half the incoming calls go to voicemail and he doesn't even know right. it. And so mm -hmm. I would say, well, if you're, what if you gave up one of your assistants and you made your temporaries and you and you took a, an online course right. on how to load autoclave and I put another uh, turn one of your assistants into receptionist when your current one is eight to five. And I'm going to put your assistant up there and the phone start ringing at six. I'm going to have her go six to two and take a lunch 11 to 12. And I'm going to have your current receptionist that comes in at eight, come in at nine. And she's going to stay till 6.30 p.m. And instead of half of your calls going to voicemail, you're going to answer twice as many calls. I don't care if you're Domino's Pizza. If you answer right. twice as many calls, you sell twice as many pizzas. And right. they, they don't get that. No, they don't. They don't. They Sometimes they think having more people be in the back can be more productive, but it's not because you're losing things that happen up front. They're going to the wayside. And somebody, one person can only do so much. So it's, it's finding the balance and equaling the, and find, equaling the balance to make it more productive. How do you, um, are you a fan of recording uh, the phone calls? Well, mm, it depends. I think it's good educational purpose for someone to hear. Um, we used to use, um, I forget the name of the system, but our phone calls we, we recorded and we would go over, um, you know, how we handled the call and why didn't they schedule. And it's, you know, it's, it's different, but I think you should have someone to listen. I think it should be a team effort. I think the practice leader, shall I say, should listen to how the other person is answering the phone and have someone listen to her to kind of bounce the ideas off of each other. So it shouldn't just be a one, you know, the doctor saying, oh, you didn't answer that right because that person didn't schedule. Well, you didn't listen to the patient. They're, they're Medicaid. We don't take Medicaid. So she's not going to schedule. So When you're dealing with clients, uh, um, what percent of them would you describe as a PPO practice and what percent do not participate with any PPOs? So right now, I would say I'm about 50%. 50, so 50 I have, percent have PPOs? Yes. Mm-hmm. And if not more, no, we'll see. I would say, yeah, make that 60. Cause I have a couple offices that they're not in network with any insurances. They work with them as a contribution towards your treatment, but they're not in network and they are very, very successful. Um, they, they are new, putting new systems into place. I wasn't there to make them millions more dollars. I was there to, they wanted a better recare system. They wanted a better treatment tracking system. 
So I was there to help with them. They changed over to a different patient communication system to better um, help them out and help the girls. But they're very, you know, like their numbers were great. It's just they wanted to be better. They didn't want to, it's not that they want to make more money. It's just they wanted to be better for the front office. What do you say to a dentist who says, uh, it seems like my number one, uh, you know, my, my production is a dollar, but my adjustments are 40 cents. Then you pay labor 28 and lab 10 and uh, supply six and rent five and uh, all, everything else uh, 10. I mean, the adjustments are 40 cents. Some, some people that's just you know it just wears on them what, what what do you what do you think of this uh trend of uh so many offices taking so many ppos it's hard i mean it depends on the area that you're in exactly. i mean if you're in a you know if you're in a lower income area where ppos are are rampant and that's how they're going to do their dentistry fine but if you're in uh, Silicon Valley, where people the average are making six figures, why would you want to be in network with insurance? I think it is really based on your demographics and how you can help your community um, grow and get the dental care that they need. I mean, you can be more efficient chairside to keep your overhead down and your costs down and, and have your systems in place, but you can be a very successful PPO practice. I really truly believe it. It's just putting the right things in, in place. I mean, if you, like I said, if you're in Silicon Valley, I don't think you should be in network with because those people have loads of money to pay on dentistry, I think, don't they? A lot of times when a practice is um, not doing well or the dentist says it's flat, I'm not really growing, they, a lot of times they have the impulse to make a very large purchase. And right. I want to know if you think any of these large purchases are a great return on investment and a great addition. There's chair site milling. There's oral scanners. There's lasers. There's um, a CB upgrading a pano to a CBCT. Right. Yeah. Do you see yeah. any of these uh, major purchases advantageous where you ever go in there and say, you know what you need to do is you need to make a, a large technology purchase? I... Well, I, as one that worked in an office that's a high volume steric office, I can say you need to really think about it and calculate it because we purchased our steric in 2007. The first time we used it was in 2008. Why? Because we didn't do any implementation. We didn't implement it into the practice. We let it sit in the corner until I finally said, what are we doing? This thing costs a hundred and some odd thousand dollars. It's just sitting here. So we went and we came out to Scottsdale, the center of dentistry, and we got educated. I was educated. I was this only CEREC designer in my office before I retired. Um, so hopefully his new assistant was able to bring up to speed or he's been doing his own CEREC's. But so it's implement, implementing any of these things that can make you more money. You just can't take these five, $6,000 courses and come back and regurgitate this material to your team and say, okay, make it work. That's not how it works. It's not sure how it should work. You should bring your whole team and then sit down and devise a plan on how you're going to get your return of investment back. I mean, if you go to sleep apnea or you go to implant seminars, it, those are all great. But when you spend three, four, five thousand dollars to educate your own self and then you come back and you throw a book at your your team and say, OK, we're going to do this tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's not that doesn't work for me. And, you know, I finally I had gone to all the education and I'm the one that came back and implemented the, the conscious oral sedation that we did, the CEREC that we did, uh, the implants that we did, the sleep apnea that we did, because it was a team effort. He's spending a lot of money. You want to make it work. You want to have a good return of investment. So it's it's really having people follow through. So did you eventually make the chair side milling a profitable return on investment? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Would you recommend I did. That? I truly, I, I truly recommend any type of chair side milling, whether it's a or uh, whatever other ones they got out there with the E4D or something, as long as you implement and utilize your assistant to the best of your ability. Yeah. So they, they should be, you should be able to prep and walk away and come back and bond that crown in. When you came out to Scottsdale, did you uh, see uh, Claudia? Isn't Claudia Lovato one of your buddies? Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is. Yeah, I was just out there. When my plane, I was supposed to have a meeting with you, and my plane got uh, mechanical failure, and it was a big to do. I didn't even think I was going to make it to Arizona, but yeah, I came out there for her um, 
Uh, allied Murado Allied Speakers thing. And and yeah, so you were you were gonna do this at my house. Yes. And uh, yes. and and we were so sad because we went ahead and we we cleaned up the house, we mopped the floor, <laughs> and we vacuumed. You cleaned up. For, clean no, the for oh. no reason, and then you didn't show, and we're like, "Why did we clean up? We even washed the dishes and loaded the dishwasher, and then you didn't show. We could have been eating out a dirty way." So, how was the Murado Consulting Network? What What are your thoughts? Uh, how did, how did so that, um, it was great? I learned a lot. Um, I learned about a lot about how I can, you know, work the room and my posture, and um, I have my first speaking engagement out at Henry Shine, and I'm only speaking to dental assistants. I will only speak to dental assistants. That's my comfort zone. Um, so I'm, I'm going out there to be their kind of like their chair side leader there. So it's it's good. It was a really good conference, and it's a really good thing to be part of. You know so. what? Uh, dental Town has uh, like 450 courses. I don't think we've ever made a course uh, just for dental assistants. I'll tell you what. We should. Uh, I'll, I'll, we I'll should. tell you why you should. It'd be your best marketing and I, um, I, I've spoke for every major meeting and, um, I, I, you know, yeah. for all these countries, you know what the number one complaint is on every mm -hmm. dental meeting after they do the dental meeting? Uh, mm -hmm. there's nothing there for my staff. That is why you always see, um, practice management people at all the conventions, because if you just have root canals, fillings, crowns, and bone grafting, then the hygienist right. and the assistant are associated, uh, hello. And that's why the ADOM meeting has gotten so big. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting that as the major meeting attendance is going down, ADOM right. is going up. And when you read yep. the complaints, and I've been shared those complaints uh, for uh, 20 years, and it's always there's nothing there for my staff. So if you, it's kind of like your demo day. If you did an hour online, see, you ought to call it for dental assistance only. And, uh, That's right. and then all these people, especially meeting planners, would sit there and say, wow, we, we want to solve that problem. Um, same thing, another institute that took off huge was the, um, mm -hmm. out of Atlanta, Georgia, the, uh, um, what's the, um, the scheduling institute. Uh, right. The mm -hmm. scheduling institute exploded because Hinman, in his own backyard, they never had a course right. for a front office. Uh, I mean, who would have a course for a person whose occupation is named after a piece of furniture? Why would they have? I mean, who's <laughs> going to be the front desk course sponsored by IKEA? I mean, they never, yeah. they never addressed that, even though it's a huge complaint. And in the same city, Atlanta, the scheduling institute says. We're going to make a course just for that lady answering the phone because what Howard said earlier about the Awatuki chamber, business chamber, usually the person mm -hmm. uh, in sales uh, answering the phone, answering the leads, from that, that, that's the highest paid person. And in dentistry, and, and, uh, it's uh, just an oversight. Right. And Lisa, Lisa, the front desk lady, she has a great course on dentalpost.net edu. So she has a great course too, Lisa does. Um, about phone conversations and stuff. So she's really great. But I was just at a course in our local area and they too, they had, they had something for the doctors, risk management and infection control. And they had some oral systemic thing. And then they had some for the hygienist, but they had nothing for front desk and nothing for assistance. So a lot of these conferences are wondering why their attendance is down because it should be a team building event. They should have something for everybody in the office, not just certain somebody's. Right, because it's a whole team thing. Yeah, um, I um, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, Claudia. All these people you're talking about. I'm looking on uh, um, you guys when you were out here. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was um, um, gosh, it was Deborah Sabatini, Lisa Marie Spradley, yeah. Susan Robinson, Danielle. Priscilla, Claudia Lovato, Mary Beth Mahonas, Ritu Ray. I mean, you, you girls have done so much for dentistry. And a big shout out to Mary Beth when I was lecturing at oh, the- Oh, I uh, love her. Well, when I was lecturing uh, for Patterson at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I was <laughs> so cool. I mean- it's, Oh, it, I can imagine. It's the shape of a, the old phonograph and they have escalators going up and then the big opening at the top is the speaking room which all these famous people had played in and all that stuff like that. But uh, she uh, picked me up, her and her husband, and uh, took us out to, I forgot the uh, 
bar district, but it's a couple block area downtown Cleveland where they paved the streets, no cars, and I mean, just uh, just just an uh, amazing uh, uh, person. Uh, um, what? Yeah, you, you girls are doing amazing things for Dunlops. Oh, thanks. thanks. So, so I, I, can't, love it. I can't I love it. believe we've uh, gone an hour. Um, oh, my gosh. Are we over our time limit? <laughs> I, I was um, I was wondering, um, you, 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 you sound like you, your bus is two days, $1,500. One day, you're just going to, the first day, you're just going to observe what's broken. And then the second day, you're going to fix it. Who is your, um, who is your, who's listening to you right now? Who's your ideal client? Who should call you uh, to come to their office? My, my ideal client, the one that goes home at night and the doctor says, I just wish I could fix X, Y, and Z. I don't want to hire a big whole, you know, big consultant to ramp up my whole practice. I just want to fix my schedule. You know, I worked with a wonderful doctor a couple weeks ago out in Ohio for four days just to fix the schedule. But when I got in there, there was other little things that he could tweak to be better. And I gave those tips to him too. So my ideal is one that just says, you know what, I need help with, you know, getting the account receivables under control and how do we get patients to pay? Can you work with them on how conversations? And I go in there and I'll, I'll answer the phone. I'll, I'll check out patients. If I know how to use your software problem, I'll help out in any way I can. I don't just sit there and I get myself right in as I am part of the team. I mean, the office I went out into in Ohio, I spent an hour and a half with his assistant showing her how to take a full mouth series of x-rays because she was new and she wanted to be better. And I said, I'll sit with you, chair. So I'm not, you know, I'm not just here for that. I'll help you however I can help you. So it's, I want the one that just has one pain of his and they just want it. And I can sit here and tell you most of all my listeners, I'm old enough to be your dad. And I'm telling you, and I'll tell you, a million, well, I'm only yeah. 43. I'm 50. I'm 55. So the, I mean, almost, not old enough to be, well, maybe. Okay. Yeah, if, if you're 30, I mean, I could, have, I, I had you at 25. Plus since I grew up Catholic in Kansas, they started having kids at 16. You know, when I graduated from high school in 1980, 10% of the girls in my class were showing Oh my well, gosh. I'm not talking about pregnant. You didn't know who was pregnant, but I'm talking about you at, at the ceremony, you knew they were pregnant. Ten <laughs> percent. So yeah. So if I'm seventeen years older than you, I could be your dad if you grew up Catholic in Kansas. Just a little bit. But but the point I'm always gonna beat over your head is um Gosh, just get your house in order. You, yes. you, um, just you. You'll love dentistry more. You won't burn out. You'll make so much more money. Mm -hmm. And and you always you always solve it exactly the wrong way. You go yes. into more debt, more debt, more mm -hmm. debt, and then the more debt causes more yep, stress, more true. burnout, more disease, more depression. And every time I meet a dentist who just has a simpleton practice, they just do cleanings, exams root canals, fillings, they, they, don't, yeah. they, don't, they don't place implants, they don't do sleep apnea, they don't do Invisalign, they don't do all the stuff, they don't have the initials in their behind their name, they just do a million a year and take home 350 on a four-day work week. God, they're so happy, and those are the mm -hmm. guys, those are the guys that if they decide to get into chair-side milling, they just write a check for 150 and buy the damn machine. If they want to get right. an iTero or they want to get a CBCT, they write a check. Whereas the other person is completely broke, uh, $350,000 student loan, $750,000 practice debt. They're over mm -hmm. out of control. They're stressed out. Their house isn't in order. And they're going into more debt. So I'm going to say it for the 18th millionth time, dental office consultants – and there's all types. And by the time you're 55, yeah. you will have had a dozen different ones come in. But all my homies who, who invested in consultants make two to three times as much money as all the dentists who invested all their money in clinical skills. And there's nothing that pisses off the best dentist in the county. Like, well, why am I the best dentist in Salina, Kansas? And I make the least amount of money. And that, that idiot across the street who is not a good dentist, 
Right. He, he's driving the, the big old Range Rover and has all the money in the big house. It's not fair. And you know what? It's not fair when you're a little deer and you go to the creek to drink some water and a damn tiger jumps out and eats you. Life is not fair. <laughs> life, That's is a good analogy. A, life is a no. summary of all the decisions you've made. And you right. went to school to become a dentist. Butter, butter, bad. And you went to school to become a dentist and now you own a business. And so you yeah. can't just be a dentist. You own no, a business, I, and I think the business is 51% of the challenge, and the actual right. dentistry is 49%. So get your house right. in order. Julie Vardy yeah. can get your house in order. I'll vouch hey. for her any day of the week. Anytime. Love Anytime. you to death. Uh, thank you oh, so thank you much. Howard. Thank you so oh, much for giving you. me an hour of your time today. Oh, Anytime. Anytime.